When people look at the current environment, you talked about we're seeing things unfold in real time. Uh, viewers of this channel and our subscribers have been watching you and watching us for some time and a lot of our guests, so they know what you're talking about when you say that. But what would you consider to be like the key signposts that you've observed in real time recently that convince you that we are hurtling uh, towards a the kind of crisis that you're describing? Oh, that's pretty simple. Just look at credit markets all across the world. Interest rates have exploded. Uh, I mean, we're now well above 4% on the yield curve in the U.S. And it's it's important to understand that that interest rates, if you look in the past, every time the Fed has raised interest rates, they've broken something. This time around, we are from a systemic standpoint, we're more over levered than any any time in history, bar none. And now they're they're raising rates more aggressively than any time in history. And you're watching the credit markets literally melt down uh, as interest rates go up, bond prices go down and the bonds, the credit, U.S. Treasuries, those are the foundation for the entire system. Now, getting back to raising rates aggressively on the most overlevered system in all of history, what would you expect to happen? Uh, people can't refinance. Uh, a, a year ago, or not even a year ago, January 1st, I think uh, interest rates on a, a 30-year mortgage were three, three and a quarter percent. Now they're over 7%. So if you qualified for a million dollar house at the beginning, beginning of the year, now maybe you qualify for a $500,000 house. The point is higher interest rates discount asset values and, and everything is borrowed against. Everything has all, all collateral is already encumbered. So there's no, there's no opportunity to refinance at lower rates. At this point, there, there is no opportunity to refinance at all. So what I'm getting at is the higher rates are going to blow up, pop, whatever term you want to use, the debt bubble. And we we have lived through an everything bubble where everything has gone up and it's gone up based or by the use of credit. Now we're seeing the other side of the sword and it's a very sharp edge. You talked to us last time about how many times credit is used to do the simplest things that we take for granted in our daily lives. You, sm you mentioned like if you go buy a loaf of bread at the store, it's, I forget if you said 10 or 20 or 50 uses of credit that, that had to happen in order for that to, to get there because of the truck and the fuel and the, and the store and everything along the way, the, the wheat and so on. Um, help people understand the way that you look at it when there's a strain that can result in a illiquidity of freezing a lockup in the in the credit system how that will immediately affect ordinary people's lives for instance with that loaf of bread let's say that there's a dozen uh different uses of credit if any one of those dozen uses of credit becomes unavailable there's no loaf of bread i mean it's, it's pretty cut and dry it's not uh it's, it's like a it's like a chain if one of the links breaks the chain is broken in half and it doesn't work any longer. And that's the way the supply chain works. That's the way it works because every single use or, or every single operation or part of the final product depends on credit. And if credit's not available, the product doesn't doesn't get manufactured or, or brought to market. So it sounds like what you're saying is any type of significant strain or dysfunction or breakdown in the credit system will impact somewhere in the supply chain and you will get disruptions and outages and unavailability of things that we take for granted right now. Uh, and you mentioned that one of the remedies that you use for that is for preparing and stocking up ahead of time. Any other preparatory approaches that you recommend for people? Um, yeah, and I actually started doing this a couple years ago. Uh, if you have the means uh, let's say you you uh, you've you've done things like secured your power supply, your water, things like that. You may want to uh, buy spare parts for your air conditioners or your heaters, or if you have well pumps, you know, have a spare. Be able to re totally rebuild a well house. Um, the lead time, the lag time, on some of these items is 
two months, three months, six months. So if you order it now, uh, you know, you may not get it for six months. I ordered a hand pump, uh, I think it was October, or just a little over a year ago, September, October, and I didn't get that, I don't think, until uh, May or June. And once it was on my property, I just had it installed uh, maybe a month ago. But once it's on property, you will be able to find labor or, you know, if you know how to do it yourself, you'll be able to, to get it done. But you can't get it done if you don't have the parts. So it's a good idea to go through uh, just even things like car batteries, tires, uh, have some, some jugs of gasoline stored back. Uh, some quarts of oil, just stuff that you know that you're going to use, buy them now. And besides, you're buying them now, it's going to be cheaper than later. Yeah, that's a good point. In fact, that's a phenomenon we should talk about in a minute about, about the self-fulfilling prophecy of runaway uh, price inflation when people start to realize that. Um, but folks, if you are going to store gasoline, make sure you put stabilizer chemical in there so that it can actually be good within six to nine or 12 months and not, not go bad within one season. Um, Okay, so before we get into the next question, let's let's touch on this point about that you just brought up about the some people call it the crack up boom in Austrian economics. It's when people realize that the currency is going down the drain for one reason or another, and real things are going to be where it's at. So they try to get into real things before the other guy, and that drives up prices even faster than they would have been otherwise. Uh, can you tell us about what your expectations and observations are around that? Um, yeah, perfect example are silver and gold. I mean, I've, I can't tell you how many times in the last three to six months people have contacted me and said, Bill, I want to buy gold, I want to buy silver, I want to do it today, and I want the money out of my account today. Um, that's not so much for fear of the dollar collapsing as opposed to a fear of the banking system collapsing, but it will get to the point where there's going to be fear of my dollar is not going to buy anything I need to get rid of it now. Uh, and and that's why you're seeing these warehouses get cleaned out. That's why you're seeing the premiums on gold and silver rise so rapidly. Is It's a function of people saying, I want out of my dollars, I want out of my bank account, and I want to do it now. And there's a sense of urgency. I very much what I've experienced as well. In fact, my wife and I uh, having same conversations like that. Um, you, you, you've been talking about two different paths that both lead perhaps to the same end point. One is that there may be this black swan major systemic event, whether it's a, a who knows what, a, a banking lockup or whether it's a, um, a uh, another emergency that emerges out of who knows where, like the, like the uh, COVID crisis did or something else like that, whether it's a war, whether it's whatever. So there's, there's this potential of a big bad event that's going to happen and suddenly be used as the excuse for why the system is is falling apart or maybe the system just is that fragile that some they couldn't handle the shock of such a such an event but you've also touched on just now a second thing that is happening right now and that is the draining of uh the major uh metals exchanges uh comex lbma uh even some of the major etfs like uh slv etc 